He mentioned this before that when I went outside whilst the Prophet was gone, when I went outside, I only saw two types of people either monatics, hypocrites, or um, elderly people, people who were ill, people who had actual excuses. So there were, I, know, I only saw those who were excused and the monatics, the hypocrites. And obviously, he was neither of them. He, he did not have an excuse, a valid excuse, and uh, obviously, he was not from amongst the Munafiqeen either. So, this upset him a great deal. And when the Prophet came back, the Munafiqs, they came to the Prophet. Obviously, there were those who had legitimate excuses. They came, and the Prophet again, prayed for them. Then the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they came. And they gave their excuses, they made up excuses. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted their exterior, um, as is the rule of the Sharia, to accept the exterior and the intention uh, remains with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he prayed for them, he took their allegiance, he took their oath of allegiance and so on. And Sayyidina Qar bin Malik ta'ala, he on the other hand, he came, and we've gone through this in detail last week already. And he said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, if there was anybody else in the world, Allah had given me um, you know, the gift of eloquence. If there was anybody else in the world, I could have found a way out of this. And I could have saved myself 
from that person's anger. But I know that if I do tell something which is incorrect, momentarily I will save myself from your anger, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal to you and you will then I will suffer much harsher consequences. So I will stick with the truth. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have absolutely no excuse whatsoever. I was fit and well, I had enough uh, money and provisions. I don't have any reason at all. So the Prophet said, okay, then leave and wait for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to actually ju pass judgment over this matter. As he left, he says that some people from the tribe of Banu Salama, which coincidentally is the same tribe that this man was from, who actually stood up at the hook, if you remember, when the Prophet asked about Sima Qabin Malik, he said, uh, what happened to Qabin Malik? Someone stood up, and actually mentions there as well that this person was from the tribe of Banu Salama also. And he said, no, he's, he's not here because of his arrogance, and so on. And then the, the, uh, another Sahabi had stood up and sort of uh, spoken on behalf of uh, Sayyidina Qabdi Malik and had said, you know, Ya Rasulullah, this, this is wrong what he said. We have never known God to do anything but good. And the Prophet has learned to make quiet. Again, that same tribe, people from Ban Salam, he says, they came to me and they said to me, why don't you go back and you make an excuse as well? And the interesting thing was, what they actually said was, um, go back to the Prophet and you make an excuse as well. They said, you've never done anything wrong in your life before. You've never done any gunah before. We've not known you to do any, anything wrong before. This is the first time. Go to the Prophet and make an excuse and when you know, like the others, ask the Prophet to pray for your forgiveness. And if the Prophet prays for your forgiveness, surely this will be enough for you. So what they were using to actually try to encourage him to go and make this excuse, the reason and the logic behind it was the aqidah of the Sahaba, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not reject the prayers of the Prophet So therefore, if the Prophet prays for you, you know, you'll, you'll be forgiven for whatever you've done. But he says, they, they said to me, so, they were so persistent that eventually I started to think maybe they're right. Maybe I should go and do this. But then I asked them, is there anyone else who's in the same position that I am? And I was told, about two other men. And those two men, Sayyidina <coughs> Murara bin Rabi'ah al Amiri and Sayyidina Hilal bin Umayyah al Waqifi, and he says, In my knowledge, these two were very pious men. They were both participant, participants of the Battle of Badr. And as I mentioned previously last week as well, they held a great uh, status amongst the Sahaba, those 313 who had participated in the Battle of Badr. They were amongst them. And, you know, they were pious men. And if they were in this situation as well, I then re, you know, uh, reconfirmed and my resolve strengthened to actually stick with the truth. And I said, no, I told the truth, I'm going to stick with the truth. Now, we begin from here, um, I believe this is roughly where we left off last week. وَنَحَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَنْ كَلَامِنَا The punishment began, or you know, punishment per se, the Prophet ﷺ instructed the Muslims not to speak to us. This is what Sina Ghafid Malik said. People were instructed not to speak to us. And all three of us were in the same situation. <coughs> People started to sort of steer clear of us. But then I went up and he said, 
according to you know, uh, different narration, Rabbi Yaruna, people changed completely. It was, it was as if they were different people. And it came to a point where, talking about himself, Sayyid Makar bin Malik, he says that, to me, it felt like the earth had sort of closed in on me. This is how it felt. And it was a completely different place. Now, Medina felt like a strange land. And I mentioned this at the end of last week's session, that this is something for us to think about. Now, to actually understand the true depth of this situation. And I mentioned that at that time, Medina was not a huge city as we see it now. There was a city and there were different settlements. But most people knew each other. And he was from amongst the Ansar. He was resident of Medina. He'd not migrated from Mecca. He was actually from Medina. So obviously he will have had a tribe there, he'll have had relatives and so on. Everybody knew each other. And all of a sudden, on the one instruction of Rasulullah, people stopped talking to us. The world changed. There's two elements to this. One is the actual element of how difficult it must have been for these people. Because I told you, they spent 50 days in this situation with nobody talking to them. And we sort of live in a different sort of a climate. Obviously, uh, most of us, our parents <coughs> are migrants, coming here as migrants. Um, um, some of us have some extended family, others there are not many at all. And we're sort of confined to within mostly uh, seeing people within our own homes and so on. I ask you just to imagine for a second how you would feel if for 50 days, now almost two months, everybody in your home stopped speaking to you, literally refused to speak to you, you speak to them and they won't reply. Give them salam, they won't reply to your salam. Two months or 50 days just within the confines of your own home. And then I ask you to imagine, you know, if this whole town, try to imagine yourself in that position, being in Medina, your whole tribe, everybody knows each other. You're walking around, nobody's looking at you. People are stealing clear from you. you give salam to somebody, won't reply. Imagine living in this way for 50 days. And then on top of this, you know, we can only dream about having a vision of Rasulullah sallallahu so alayhi We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are able to see the Prophet sallallahu in our dream before we die. These people, they were companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi they had become accustomed to seeing Rasulullah to speaking to him and to hearing his words. And can you imagine being in the presence of the Prophet trying to look at him to, for your eyes to meet and the Prophet turn you away? This was, you know, in my opinion, this is probably the most difficult part of this whole 50 days. So, we continue from there, where we left off. Sayyidina Qadir Malik, he says that we spent 50 days, فَلَبِثْنَا عَلَى ذَلِكَ خَمْسِينَ لَيْلَ We spent 50 days in this position. And he says, فَأَمَّا صَاحِبَيْتْ my two sahibaya, my two companions, they just stayed at home. And waqa'ala fi buyutihima yamkiya. They stayed in their homes crying. That's all they did. They laid themselves down on a uh, 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 prayer mat and all they were doing. Or they sat in their homes um, just crying. And he says that as for me, I was, I was much stronger. I was younger than them. I was stronger. 
and so فَكُنْتُ أَخْرُجُ فَأَشْهَدُ الصَّلَاةِ I used to leave, I used to go to the masjid to pray salah as well. So فَأَشْهَدُ الصَّلَاةَ مَعَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ I used to go to read the prayers with the Muslims. وَأَتُوفُ فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ And I used to walk around the streets and in, around the markets. وَلَا يُكَلِّمُنِي أَحَدٌ However, he said, not a single person exchanged a single word with me. No one would talk to me. Walking around all these people, these people that you know, going to the masjid, and nobody paying any attention to him, not speaking to him. And he says, I used to come to the Prophet sallallahu And I will say salam. I would go to the Prophet sallallahu and say salam. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Or, you know, he would say salam. وَهُوَ فِي مَجْلِسِهِ And the Prophet ﷺ sat within the Sahaba, in the gathering of the Sahaba after Salah, I would go to the Prophet ﷺ and I would give him Salah. فَأَقُوفُ فِي نَفْسِي And I used to say to myself, I would think to myself, this is what he's saying here, we wouldn't say this out loud, but I said to myself, I thought to myself, هَلْ حَرَّكَ شَفَتَيْهِ بِرَدِّ السَّلَامِ أَمْ لَا That I would go and say Salah to the Prophet ﷺ and then I would focus on the lips of the Prophet And the reason for this focus would be is to actually see whether the Prophet would move his lips in order to reply for, to the salam or not. So just watching, does the Prophet reply to my salam? Then I would pray close to the Prophet and the important thing here, وَأُسَارِقُهُمْ <coughs> نَزْرًا And I would steal glances at the Prophet For those of you who have books, this might be you know, a, a place that you might want to underline. And I should take a note here. He says, I would pray next to the Prophet and I would steal glances at the Prophet Unfortunately, you know, as, because I said right from the very outset that this is, think of this as a multi-dimensional sort of a study or class. We are actually studying, inshallah, with these Aqidah and Tasawwuf in light of the Hadith same with the Prophet So, three elements, three dimensions to this study. Actually focusing now for one second on the uh, Aqidah point. Is it permissible to celebrate Milad? Um, you know, is Isal al-Sawab a valid concept? Uh, can we benefit people who have died by doing actions for them, by doing sadaqah for them. Is the Prophet وسلم, is his essence nur, um, or is he entirely bashar or entirely human? Is the Prophet وسلم, hazir and nazir? No. And so on. There's a lot of debates amongst the sects. And the, you will be surprised to hear that this is not the major, major cause of sort of uh, the differences. The biggest cause for the differences is due to some disrespect of the Prophet in some way, shape or form. And that then becomes a barrier. Below this barrier, or aside from this barrier, anything which is not from the essential elements of deen, which are known as zaruriyat e deen, anything which is not from the essence of faith. If someone does not believe in this, and it is the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamaah, at worst, he will be called someone who is misguided. He will not be called a Kafir. Yeah, he is he's still classed as a Muslim, albeit misguided. However, 
respect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and respect of Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam are two of the most important of the dhuriyat de of the necessities of faith. These are two of the most important of all the necessities of faith. Respect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and respect of Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam. And having disrespected the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam, this barrier is then broken. Then it will be deemed as an you know, actual barrier where unless that person does tawbah and repents and you know, uh, sort of remedies the situation, then that person is no longer from the Ahlul Iman. Some time ago, um, inshallah, we're going to focus on this more on a separate actual sort of uh, session on the Aqidah and the main difference. And, and I underline the main difference being the disrespect or should we say respect of Allah and respect of Rasulullah sallallahu This is the bottom line. In most of the debates, this is the bottom line. The rest of this stuff, this is stuff that can be managed and then, you know, um, can be discussed. This is completely, there's absolutely no way that that would be, uh, you know, sort of uh, permitted. And I just, uh, like I said, we're going to focus on this on a specific session, which is specifically for Aqaid. Inshallah, uh, during Juma, we're looking through the Aqaid gradually. Once we've covered the basics and, you know, we've covered uh, stuff which is below this, eventually, inshallah, we're going to do uh, a short course. It won't be over many weeks, maybe just one or two weeks. It will not take that long. But a short course actually defining who we are. Because remember, dialogue is brilliant. I'm always for dialogue, you know, whether it's interfaith dialogue or inter-denomination you know, uh, sort of uh, dialogue. That's brilliant. This is the only way we can sort of make amends and we can heal and we can bring people closer. Dialogue is all fine and it's absolutely brilliant. We do need to, however, establish our own identity and keep our own identity. Identity is just as important. And we know this from the ahadith of the Prophet Now I ask you, when the, when, when the Azan, before the Azan came into practice, when prayer was made compulsory and then they had to have a call for prayer, I'm sure most of you are aware, many different ideas were presented. Someone said beat a drum, someone said you know, blow a horn, someone said ring the bell like the Christians do. Um, all sorts of ideas came into place, and the Prophet ﷺ did not adopt any of them. Why? Because it was not unique to Islam. Islam has its own identity. And then these words were given in dream form to the Sahaba, and when the Prophet ﷺ was informed of this, this was adopted. And as you see today, it stands out in the world, wherever you go, that Azam is something unique to Islam. So identity is important. Did the Prophet ﷺ not have dialogue with the, with the Jews in Medina? Did he not have established dialogue and actually have the Treaty of Hudaybiya with the Mushrikeen of Mecca? Yet did not compromise on their identity. This was one of the offers that was made to the Prophet ﷺ. You worship our gods one year, next year we'll worship your God. No compromise on identity. We need to keep our identity. We have a specific identity, the Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah. Albeit dialogue is good, and we need to establish relations and dialogues, but we also need to be firm on what our identity is. <coughs> and inshallah, we, we will do um, eventually a course on what is our identity as, you know, uh, as a, a member of the Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah. The one thing I was going to point out here, the reason why I said you might want to underline this, and you might want to take a note here, is from an Adida perspective. Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, this idea emerged that you are not to think of Rasulullah during your prayer. And the wording that was used is actually extremely, extremely vulgar. And if absolutely, if not absolutely necessary, 
It has been my practice throughout my life never to actually quote that wording. It's so ridiculously vulgar. Um, and if people are aware of what I'm making reference to, I just try to move on. Are you aware of what I'm making reference to? Well, I see some not. But um, now I'll, I'll just partially, I'll mention partially so those of you who want, you can have some sense of what's going on. The statement goes along the lines as it would be better to think of a mule in your prayer than to actually consciously think of Rasulullah Sallallahu as we left that. The statement coming from a you know, so called Muslim. My question to this person is whose Iman and faith is stronger, yours or the Sahaba? Now, those people who we get our Iman from. How we got our Iman, how we got our faith, how we got Islam. It's been passed on from the Sahaba to the Tabi'in, from them to the Taba Tabi'in, from from them onwards, generation through generation, and then you know the book started to emerge and so on. This is how we got Islam. The first people who spread Islam were those who learned it from the Prophet and it is proven from many many ahadith, from Sahih Bukhari. If you remember um, something that um, was mentioned in the previous class that uh, Imam Asim was doing. On the last session, the Prophet before he physically departed from this world, Sayyidina Abu Bakr ta'ala, he was leading the prayer. The, the Prophet was very frail at that time. And he was in his hujra Mubarak and he, he, he removed the curtain, moved the curtain to one side from his hujra and peered into the masjid. And the setting of the, the hujra was such that I believe um, it was to the extreme left of the masjid and the Sahaba were praying here. So these people are praying here, facing straight forward in that direction and the hujra is on the extreme left. And these people are the ones who are narrating this hadith. How do they know? If they didn't actually turn around and look at the Prophet how did they know? During prayer. And then the Prophet indicated to them, then carry on with your prayer. How did they know about this indication? Then speak. Indicated. And it came to one point that the, the Sahaba did not see the Prophet for a, for a few days. Now this was absolutely, it was unbearable for them. Not being able to see the Prophet not knowing how, you know, how he's doing. And when they saw this, they had a ray of hope. They thought the Prophet is recovering, he's getting better. At the sheer joy, that the Prophet is getting better, the Sahaba say they actually they went into a state of ecstasy, literally falling over each other during the mass. And, and then you say you can't think of the Prophet consciously during prayer. Several other hadith, another hadith which is narrated by the Sahaba, during prayer, the Prophet, a very famous hadith, the Prophet stretched out his blessed hand. And then afterwards he said, you know, uh, I will, a very, very famous hadith, stretched out his hand and the Prophet said, I, will, I, I had fruits of Jannah in my grasp and I was thinking that I, I should take them and then I let them be and so on. Not much words that we, we're going to have to run short on time. But the Sahaba are the ones who are narrating this. If they were praying behind the Prophet would they not have had to look at the Prophet to actually know this? The Sahaba, even the, their prayers, Part of their prayer was watching Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How much more can you actually think of somebody than to actually be watching somebody? Is it possible to actually be watching somebody and not be thinking of them at the same time? These these kinds of sort of uh, statements and writings, these are the actual sort of major basis of the dispute. I'm sure, you know, having heard only partially um, the statement, um, you, uh, all of you, every single one of you, will be just as offended as I am. Yeah, when you read in your prayer, in your attahirat, when you send durud upon the Prophet, is it possible for anyone who understands 
what he's saying to not actually think of the Prophet at that time? Not only is it impossible, it's actually recommended. Imam Ghazali says in Ihya al when you send durud upon the Prophet in a state of at think that the Prophet think that you are in front of him. Think of yourself as being in the presence of Rasulullah and then send durud upon him. So this is something that, uh, this is why I said you need to uh, uh, highlight this and sort of take a note there. Because you can see the aqidah of the Sahaba here. Sayyidina Qabil Malik, he says, um, I would pray, I would pray close to the Prophet and I would steal glances at the Prophet And the commentator here, he says, Tashrifan um, biru'yatihi. Why? Because looking at the Prophet is such a huge virtue. Looking at the Prophet is such a huge virtue. And he actually mentions here, I, you know, uh, stealing glances, sort of looking at the Prophet through the corner of his eye. And the commentator again he says here, Fafihi anna musarikat al nazri fi salati wa kada al tifati la yatulha. He actually says that looking at somebody uh, or looking through the corner of your eye, looking at somebody during prayer will not break your prayer. So if the commentator here is not understanding that this was happening during the prayer, why would he comment here? Why would he make this? So it's quite clear that this was during the prayer and he was praying to the Prophet and it actually seems as if this is intentional, praying close to the Prophet praying but also stealing glances at the Prophet Why would he doing this? Because he says that I would steal glances at the Prophet when I would look at it and the Prophet would look away. But when I was not looking or when I was directed toward my own prayer, it fell to me as if the Prophet was looking at me. And when I looked, the Prophet turned away. This was um, Sayyidina Qabit Malik during the prayer. He says that um, the days got longer and longer, time you know, seemed like it would never end. Until one at one point he says, I went to my cousin's garden or orchard. I climbed over the wall and I went inside. And his co- cousin was Sayyidina Abu Qadada radiallahu ta'ala, another famous sahab. He was his cousin. And he said and he says, Wa ahabun nasi ilayh. Other than the Prophet, he was the most beloved to me out of all the people. In the world. Then think about this. Try to imagine yourself in this position. Your most beloved relative. Got to see him. I said salam to him. Fawallahi ma radda alayhi salam. Said Wallahi never replied to my salam. So I said to him, Ya Abu Qatada. Oh Abu Qatada. Surely you know that I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's message. Didn't reply. Pasakata. He didn't reply. He made quiet. Fa'uktu. And I repeated my question. And he again remained quiet. So I repeated it a third time. And the third time, when I repeated this question, he says, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Simple. Doesn't want to reply to the question, doesn't want to address the question. The question may arise here that they were instructed not to speak to them. By saying Allah wa Rasuluhu A'lam, he's just broken that rule. Or that he, he's broken that restriction that was important. No. The ulama, the commentators, they say there's several possibilities. One most appealing to my mind is the fact that he was making a statement of, you know, a, a statement, a general statement. He was just proclaiming that Allah and his messenger knows best. He was not addressing Sayyidina Qabir Malik. 
And so he wasn't actually actively breaking that restriction that had been imposed on him. And that's all his reply was, Allah and his messenger knows that. And another thing you may want to notice here, and you may want to note this as we go through this, you will see this crop up. And please do inform me if anywhere in the study of this book, in this extensive collection of ahadith, if you come across a sahabi being asked a question and his reply being Allahu A'lam, if you want. Almost always, Allahu wa Rasuluhu A'lam. No matter what the question, no matter what the situation, Allah and His Messenger know best. This, this is, it tells you something about the aqidah of the sahaba regarding. Uh, knowledge of Rasulullah and Allah keeping the Prophet informed. So this this was his reply. And Sayyidina Kaab bin Malik says, tears began to roll down my cheeks. I began to shed tears and I went back the way I had come, climbed over the wall and went to him. As I was walking home, whilst I was walking through the market, he says, a person from Syria came to me and he gave me a letter. He was actually looking, he was searching around for, he was asking people, who's Kaab bin Malik, where is he, where can I find him? And I heard him. I said, I'm Kaab bin Malik. So he came and gave me this letter. In the letter, this letter was from King Ghassan of Syria. <coughs> and I, he says, Bakuntu <coughs> Kaabiban. He said, I could write. In other words, I was literate. I could read and write. And obviously, someone who can write can also read as well. So that's, that's what's meant here. When he says, I, I could write, in other words, I was literate. I could read and write. So he didn't need to get anyone else's help to read. So he says, what was in the actual letter was, Amma Baq. And he says, This Hassan emperor, uh, of Syria, he said to him, I've come to know that your sahib, your companion, your messenger, he's betrayed you, he's left you. Leave him, come to me. Allah has not made you that you be degraded and dishonored in this way. Come to me, I will honor you greatly. What was Sayyidina Kabir Malik Allah's response to this letter? The response was, he says, فَقُلْتُ حِينَ قَرَأْتُهَا When I read this letter, I said to myself, وَهَذِهِ أَيْدًا مِنَ الْبَلَى This is also a test. And things have been made even more difficult for him. You know, possibly the most difficult place in his life. And he's being made this offer here by the king of Syria. Come to me and I will uh, honor you and give you whatever you wish and a huge status. He thought to himself, no, this is another test. Threw the letter into a fire, burnt it. And again, he says, when 40 nights of the 50 had passed, 40 of the 50 nights had passed, a messenger from the Prophet ﷺ came to me. And when he came, can you imagine? I just want you, I want to pause here for a second. And I want you to imagine. Think of the previous 40 days and nights. How difficult have they been? And then immediately, Sayyidina Qabil Malik, he sees someone coming and he knows he's the messenger of Rasulullah. Can you imagine how his heart will have filled up with hope? Thinking possibly, I've been forgiven. Allah's revealed a verse or Allah's said to the Prophet and he's revealed to him that we've been forgiven. Think about the hope and you know, the, what he must have been feeling at that time. How hopeful after 40 days and nights of not speaking to anyone, not being able to see or speak to the Prophet <coughs> completely on his own. In a whole city he's on his own. And after 40 days and nights this messenger from the Prophet he sees him coming from a distance Think about the hope and the feelings that will have uh, been invoked inside him. But as soon as the messenger came, what did he say? 
He says, فقال إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يأمرك أن تعت أن تعتزل امرأتك. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم instructs you to leave your women. This was the message. After all, you know, imagine it's natural. Most women, you can imagine this. After that hope building up inside him of possibly being forgiven, he's then told to leave. His wife. Can you imagine how crushing that would have that would have been? What would our response have been? This is what I want you to imagine. How would we have responded to this statement? And what it mentions is, I'm sure we can't sort of comment for certain on this because obviously he's not commented. He's not actually said this person didn't come and he didn't say salam. But the instruction to all the Muslims was not to talk to them. And he'd been given a message. Prophet said to him, "Go and give this message to Kaab bin Malik." I don't believe, unless he had specific permission from the Prophet Sallam to actually even say salam to him, I don't even think he would have said salam to him. He would have come to him, and the very first thing he would have said to him, the Prophet Sallam is instructing you to leave your wife, and that's it. No, not a single other word. How would we have responded to this after forty days? How crushing would this have been after all the hope? At seeing this messenger of Rasulullah, what was his reply? Without a, without an instant of a delay, immediately his reply was, and I want you to think about this, especially those of you who may be married, who may have families. Try to imagine, if not though, you know, having a family, having a wife, having children, you know, having sort of uh, loved and nurtured them for years. That immediately the first response of Sayyidina Kaab bin Malik to this demand of the Prophet ﷺ was, Should I divorce her or what should I do? This was the response. At a simple instruction from the Prophet ﷺ, and after receiving this crushing blow and his hopes being completely shattered. The immediate response was, should I divorce him? Is this what the Prophet ﷺ has instructed? Should I divorce him? Not a single moment's delay. And it's absolutely certain in my mind, if he had said yes, on that very spot, Sayyidina Kaabik Malik would have divorced his wife. But the messenger, he said no. He says, you're not to divorce her. You're just now to stop sort of having any relations with your wife also. So the rest of the whole community prohibited from even talking to them, even answering, even replying to their salam for 40 days and then now no contact with your wives. So Sayyidina Ghar bin Malik ta'ala, he says that the same message was sent to the other two sahaba as well. <coughs> Murara bin Rabia and Hilal bin Umayya al-Waqfi ta'ala. And out of them Initially, he says, I said to my wife, I said to her, go to your parents. Go to stay with your parents until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides my fate. So I sent her to her parents. And the same message had been sent to the other two sahaba as well. And the wife of Hilal bin Umayyah, she went to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, Hilal bin Umayyah, he's, he's, he's old and weak. Can't look after himself, especially after these 40 days, he's become even more weak. He just sits in his house and cries all day, all night. Can I stay to serve him? Just to you know, just to serve him, and would that displease you? The Prophet said, he gave gave her permission. He said, stay and serve him, look after his needs, don't go near him. She then replied, she said, Ya Rasulullah, he, he has no desire for this. All he's done since the day that he's received, you know, you, since the day that he feels he, he's displeased you, since that time, since that moment, he's been sat there crying over these past 40 days. This was their thought at displeasing Rasulullah. And I want to bring something else in here. The Prophet said to the Sahaba at one point, before he passed away, he said to them, 
that he got them ready for his physical departure. He said, Hayati khayrun lakum wa mamati khayrun lakum. My physical life amongst you is good for you and my passing away also good for you. Obviously physical life no one can question how that will have been good for the Sahara. We can all think and imagine the blessings and the barakah. What about passing away? The Prophet explained. He said, once I've passed away, your amal, your actions will be presented to me. Those of you who've done good actions, I will be pleased about this and I will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine how your reward will increase if your action pleases the Prophet and he prays for you? Can you imagine how much reward Allah will give you for that action? On the other hand, the Prophet said, those of you who do wrong things, those that displease me or bad deeds, I will seek forgiveness on your behalf from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that side of it as well. The Sahaba and having displeased the Prophet this, this was their state, 40 days and nights, <coughs> constantly just crying. We do things every day, every day we do things which would displease the Prophet Do we ever stop to think for a moment what effect <coughs> this will be having on the Prophet ﷺ when he sees these actions of ours presented to him. What effect will this have? This is something that we need to... This is the Tathawu part coming into play now. This is something that we need to think about. The presence of Niyyah and all of this you've done before. When you do something, try to remember this is going to be presented before the Prophet ﷺ. Is this going to please him or displease him? If I displease him, inevitably, who am I displeasing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose to punish you at displeasing his beloved, will you be able to bear this punishment? This is something we need to think about. But anyway, Sayyidina Hilal bin Umayyah, his wife explained to the Prophet that there's no need for any of this. He's, been, he's just been sat there crying. And she, so she promised that she would stay physically, should stay away from him, not have relations, but would stay to serve him. Sayyidina Qab bin Malik, he says again, another test for him. People came to him. They said, Hilal bin Umayyah's wife, she went and she got permission. She's able to stay and serve him. Why don't you do the same? But this time, firm resolve. He said, no. I don't, I don't know what the Prophet reply is going to be. And I don't want to find out. The instruction is to let them be. And she sent her to her parents, said, go to your parents, stay there. So, another 10 days and nights, he says, we spent in this situation. 50 nights were complete. On the morning, on that morning after the 50th night, Fajr time, I'm praying. And someone at the top of his voice, stood on a mountain, shouted out. And he actually explained before this, he explained what his physical situation was. So on that 50th night, after the night, at Fajr time, I was sat there. And the world, the whole world had closed in on me. My whole life had closed in on me. You know, try to imagine this. The whole world tightened around him and he says, I had, you know, basically fed up of even my life and you know my life was closing in on me. This is how I felt. And Allah describes this in the Quran and He uses those words. Wadaqat Aliya Wadaqat Aliya Abdu Bima Rahm. This is a terminology used in the Quran that the earth was closing in on me. Just at that point he says suddenly I heard the voice of a person standing on a mountain top shouting at the top of his voice. And what was he saying? Ya Ka'u Malik Abshir. Good news, Ka'bin Malik, good news. And then he says, at that moment, I was relieved. I realized that somehow or other we had been forgiven. So 
I went straight into sajda. This is where some of the scholars, they take the permissibility of sajda of shukr. Because he, out of uh, gratitude, he went immediately into sajda. So, I, he then says that people started coming to me to give me this good news. And it was a custom of the Arabs at the time that when people gave them good news, they would give them a gift. Someone came to somebody with very good news, it was a custom to, to give him a gift, the first person who brought this news. This is why we see when the Prophet ﷺ was born, and Thuwaiba, uh, she came to Abu Lahab to give him this good news, um, hearing that his uh, deceased brother had been blessed with a son, he indicated to her with his finger and he said, Oh, you are free. So th this was a custom. Sayyidina Ka'ab bin Malik says, At that point, the only thing I had on me was the clothes on my body. And he says, I borrowed clothes for somebody and I took these clothes off and gave them to the person who gave me this news. This is how pleased I was at having received this news. And he says, I went to the Prophet وسلم, and all the while, whilst I was going there as well, people meeting me on the way, giving me good news, um, glad tidings and sort of uh, Mubarak as such, congratulations. And I saw the Prophet وسلم, sitting with the Sahaba crowded around him. As I entered into this majlis of the Prophet وسلم, Sayyidina Talha bin Ubaidullah he stood up and he shook hands with me and he congratulated me. Out of everybody, out especially out of the Muhajireen, he was the first person to actually stand up and congratulate me. <coughs> and he says, I never forgot this for the rest of my life. This was such a loving and sort of generous and caring thing that he did that he was the first man out of all of the Sahaba sat around the Prophet he was the first one to actually stand up and shake his <coughs> hand and greet me and congratulate me. He said, I never forgot this for the rest of my life. Came to the Prophet and he asked the Prophet one question. He said, you have some blood. And this is what we're going to finish on today. There's a very small portion of it left. Inshallah, we'll cover that and move on to the next session <coughs> in the next session. Um, it's, it's basically, it's about the verses that were revealed in honor of Sayyidina Qabir Malik and the other two Sahaba uh, announcing their Tawbah. We'll, um, so we'll discuss them, Inshallah, in the next session. The story as it is, is now almost complete. Sayyidina Qabir Malik, he came to the Prophet and he asked, he said, Ya Rasulullah He says, Amin indika, Ya Rasulullah sallam, am min indillah. Ya Rasulullah, this forgiveness, this announcement, does it come from you or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the thing I want to say here is, we can see here that it would have been, and it was their belief that the Prophet sallam, was given the authority to make these decisions by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contrary to some beliefs which is why he asked Ya Rasulullah is this from you? <coughs> is this under your authority? obviously with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or is it under your authority? or is it directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? has it been revealed in the Quran or is it directly <coughs> wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? and the Prophet said La bal bin indillahi azawajal not from, this is not under my authority, this is from directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu then told of the verses that had been revealed in honor of these sahaba. And inshallah, that is what we'll discuss briefly next session before we move on to the next chapter, which is also an amazing chapter, an amazingly uh, important ahadith as well. Next chapter is patience and sabr. So, inshallah, yeah, there'll be a lot of the sub of in that, but also I can think of a couple of ahadith which are very, very helpful for our aqidah, uh, in strengthening our aqidah as well. And we'll stop there for today. Um, does anybody have any questions?
over anything that has been discussed um, so far. No. Seem to be very um, quiet, especially with regards to questions. Questions are the key to knowledge. If there's ever any doubt or any ambiguity over anything, please don't hesitate about asking questions. Um, you can, as I said before as well, you can send them forward uh, in writing or feel free to stick your hand up and ask a question. Um, I believe there's been some forms going around. The reason for this is because um, it's a feedback form and it's also uh, a request for your contact information. I just want to announce, and for all of you, for those who have not attended this week, possibly due to the weather or for some other reason, if you know somebody who normally attends and has not attended this week, please get that message to them as well, as I announced at the end of last week's session. Next Friday's session has been rescheduled for Thursday instead. Just for one week, just for next week, that will be on Thursday instead of Friday. And then after that, we'll go back to our normal routines. I have a, uh, an important commitment which I can't get out of. So next Friday's session has been uh, uh, changed, has been uh, rescheduled for Thursday. And if you leave your contact information, that's a way of the management to actually get in touch with you and maybe text you or alert you beforehand if there is any sudden change in the schedule or any other important information. So it's in everybody's uh, benefit to please uh, fill those in and give them back uh, to the management so that they can be sorted out. And obviously, um, your information will be stored securely and will, will be used to alert you of any uh, possible change in the schedule or any other important information. And as you're doing this, we'll just do the answer.